However, there are also provisions to allow reduced rest periods in certain circumstances. It is particularly concerning that these regulations actually increase the number of hours that can be flown after reduced rest, essentially allowing a normal shift to take place even where the minimum rest requirements have not been met. This is not scientifically sound. Neither the FAA uh, in the United States nor the EASA in Europe allow this to happen outside their minimum standards, which are 10 hours with an 8-hour sleep opportunity. CAS has also set maximum flight duty periods be beyond what other regulators consider acceptable, fixing flight duty periods at 14 hours within, with 10 hours at the controls. In contrast, the FAA and the EASA have set their normal maximums at 13 hours. The FAA also refused to extend the time at the controls to 10 hours, stating, and I quote, the FAA agrees with the overwhelming number of com commenters who state that a 10-hour flight time limit is not justified by current scientific data. A series of studies examining the national accident rate has shown that 10 hours spent at work pose a much greater risk of an accident than eight or nine hours spent at work. Uh, it is also important, Mr Acting Deputy President, to note that these maximum FDPs are tightly controlled in other jurisdictions. For example, while EASA allows 14-hour FDPs as an operational extension to a duty, the other limitations it has in place would mean that a pilot regularly performing these maximum duties would only be flying an average of seven days a month. In Australia, a pattern of very long duties followed by a shorter duty rest can result in a 14-hour duty every three to four days consistently until other limitations finally come into play. Further, the changes to delayed reporting times in the regulations could extend a pilot's time awake far beyond what is considered reasonable or, if we consider the scientific research, safe. For example, the allowable flight duty period for one to two sectors is 13 hours. Given that a pilot would likely need to be awake at least two hours before the start of the FDP and that the reporting time can be delayed for four hours, a pilot could finish that FDP some 19 hours after waking up. Even worse, the regulations allow an additional sector to be added to the pilot's FDP on top of this, increasing the total time by one hour in total with 30 minutes extra at the controls. These extensions can occur in, quote, unforeseen operational circumstances, end of quote. While the regulations obviously need to allow extensions to take place, there should be reasonable limits in place to ensure fatigue is appropriately managed where various standalone extensions overlap. The instrument also doesn't adequately manage the need for pre-flight rest during standby periods. Firstly, it's important to note that standby cannot be equated with being off duty or even on a rest period. Being on standby presents its own challenges in relation to fatigue because the pilot needs to remain sufficiently rested to begin a shift at any time during that standby period. For example, a pilot might be on call from the morning to the evening and end up being on duty just when they would be preparing to sleep in a normal situation. Anticipatory stress can also impact on sleep and rest, and I believe that has not been incorporated in these regulations to any sufficient degree at all. This part of the regulations is based purely on regulatory experience, so-called, rather than science, the old because we say so argument again. For example, in a worst case scenario, a pilot could be on standby for 12 hours before being called out for a 14-hour duty. That duty could then be extended by an hour due to unforeseen operational circumstances. That would mean the pilot would finally finish their FDP 27 hours after they first prepared to fly. In 2007, CASA, Qantas, APA and the University of South Australia undertook comprehensive research into pilot fatigue. This report contributed significantly to the understanding of this issue in Australia, but its findings and research seem to have been largely ignored by the, in the shaping of these regulations. And Mr Acting Deputy President, that is extraordinary. You don't ignore compelling evidence like that. In particular, the information in the report indicated that FDPs and rest facilities for augmented crews need further refinement, something the regulations do not address. The regulations regarding consultation through the fatigue safety action groups are also a concern. While the regulations account for consultation with all stakeholders when operators develop their own fatigue risk management system, there is no requirement for consultation through this process 
where the operators choose to work according to the base regulations. This consultation process is vitally important and should be specifically mandated in the regulations. Further, the regulations should also contain a specific dispute resolution process. There are significant industry concerns about CAS's regulatory enforcement in other areas, and a mandated process would go some way towards addressing any potential issues in this area. Essentially, while there are improvements in these regulations, we must take this opportunity to address these points, these valid points, based on evidence as a matter of urgency. Australia has always been considered a world leader in aviation safety, and we should seek to uphold that reputation. Scientific research can provide us with far greater insights into fatigue risks and management than ever before. There are areas of these regulations that are far behind that research and, to put it, and, to put it bluntly, pose a safety risk. Safety regulations should be constantly evolving in line with research and technological developments. They should not be static, as Australia's fatigue regulations have largely been for over 60 years. My reason for moving to disallow, to disallow this instrument is that if we consider the history of aviation safety regulations in Australia, we are unlikely to get a further update to these areas of concern any time soon. It may be many years. If it has taken us 60 years to get to this point, we cannot put our trust in a short-term or an even a medium-term fix. The largest group of, pilot, of airline pilots in Australia, APA, has suggested that we form an independent scientific panel to review the instrument. They have committed to accepting the panel's findings. I fully support this review prior to finalisation of these regulations. This is our chance to maintain Australia's reputation and to reclaim our position as world leaders. And when it comes to a dispute between uh, the regulator or the pilots, I really have to side with the pilots. This is also our chance to save lives, and, and that alone should be the reason to support this motion. Thank you. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. We, the opposition, do not support the disallowance. When we were in government, we did not support the disallowance. The only ones who have changed their position is the now government. Thank you. Senator Fawcett. 